All right. Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to be in Psalm 102. Psalm 102, the Lone Bird Song. Uh, last year, my wife and I and our, our kids, we enjoyed some SeaWorld passes. They, they've since expired, but that's okay. We're doing the zoo this year, one thing at a time, you know? Last year was, this, was SeaWorld, and it's always a good time going over there, check out the shark tank. Any of you guys ever been? You go on that little uh, moving sidewalk through the shark tank, and now there's a Shamu educational experience rather than the Shamu show that we grew up with. But SeaWorld's kind of changed over the years. There's, there's an increasing amount of roller coasters and, and kiddie rides in the park. I just saw on the news that SeaWorld is $10 million in debt. They're overdue on their rent. They haven't paid, so I guess they're funneling that into these uh, extreme rides. And it's not only the adult rides that are extreme, it's the kiddie ones that are extreme too. All right, there is something that is called the, the circular swings. Any of you ever been unfortunate enough to go on one of these? My girls love this ride, and I hate it. I hate it with a, with a righteous passion. Uh, they're under height, so they always need an accompanying adult to go with them. And my wife and I look at each other, and I'm like, okay, I know. I, this is my card here. So I go, and it, it's a horrible 90 seconds of dizziness. It just, it just goes around in a circle, in a circle. And I'm like, all right, I love my kids, so I guess I got to do this ride. But there's only one way that I could describe it. One word is agony. But that's the one word. If I had to boil it down, it's agony. And uh, that, that brings us to Psalm 102 this morning. It was a... <laughs> I just wanted to tell that story. All right. It was written by somebody who was walking through a season of agony. Actually, look at the, the superscript of this psalm. I, I thought this was unusual because it's a bit of a... Well, it gives you a lot of detail here. It says, prayer of the afflicted when he is faint and pours out his complaint before the Lord. So that's the superscript. And we see this is written by someone walking through a season of agony. Brutally painful time in his life. It was a psalm written for private meditation for suffering saints, essentially, is what it is. And maybe you can relate to the kind of season that we're going to read about this man having. Maybe you've had those times in your life when you're going through it. When you lay awake at night and you can't sleep, but then in the morning, when the morning comes, you can't drag yourself out of bed. Those times when you think to yourself, I don't know if I can do this anymore. So welcome to Psalm 102. That's what this psalm is. It's an anonymous psalm. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know the name of the author. But we do know some things about him, that he was a patriot. He was lamenting over his country's distress. We're going to see him talk about that. And we also see that it is a penitential psalm. Actually, some churches, they uh, have liturgies where they have the seven penitential psalms, and this is one of those. As we're going to see, the first 11 verses of this psalm are a passionate expression of grief, sorrow, and pain. He's in deep trouble. He's in real deep trouble. He's going through despair, danger. He feels weak. And yet, by the end of the psalm, we're going to see that he keeps the faith. And that is the encouragement I want us to leave here with today, that there is hope. Uh, we see the psalmist, he keeps his faith in his all-powerful God, and he even looks forward with anticipation, with hope, to the work that God is going to accomplish, both in his nation and in his own personal life. So let's, uh, let's jump right in, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to pause and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can open up your word together. This is your word, Lord, and so we respect it as such. And we know that it has power in it. Father, would we apply it to our lives so that we can live lives that are pleasing to you. It's amazing the work that you do when we give our hearts to you. So Father, we give our hearts to you now and ask for you to do your work today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, verse one and two, Psalm 102. The psalmist cries out, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me, and the day when I call, answer me quickly. And this is an interesting way to begin the psalm. It's a, the psalmist is, it sounds like he's begging God, and that's really what he's doing. He's begging God. He's saying, you know, don't, don't pretend like you can't see me right now. I, I know there's a lot of other issues out there, but I need you to see me personally. Incline your ear to me. Answer my prayers, God. 
And one thing is clear is that the psalmist is not just praying to pray or, or, or talking to talk. He's praying in a particular way. He has a real desire to reach God's ear, to reach God's heart. And, and we could see this in the emotion. God, please hear me. I have to be heard. He's in a desperate situation of some kind. He has a desperate need for God's attention and, and immediate intervention in his situation. And one thing that, that's true is that it usually makes us feel better when we tell our troubles to other people, when we share our troubles with others. It's, it's therapeutic, and it can feel like a great relief when you're distressed and you can, you can unload and share your troubles with another caring person. We know that the Lord asks us to do this in, in, in Peter. It says in, in the New Testament, it says, cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. There's just something about being heard, you know, and, and if we feel that comfort when we unload with, with the people around us, multiply that by a million when it's with God, because he's the one who can actually change situations. He is the one who has power to help us, and he cares about us infinitely more than we know. And uh, I find comfort in these very first verses of this psalm, because it shows us that God actually listens to needy complainers. <laughs> and sometimes that's, that's who I am. And so here it is, preserved in scripture for us, this man who's complaining, who, who's in great need, and he knows that God is going to hear him, that God is big enough, strong enough to handle his situations, and, and God doesn't roll his eyes and say, well, get over it. He doesn't. In fact, the writer of Psalm 102 is not the only needy complainer in the Bible. There's quite a few of them. Listen to the words of Jeremiah. The major prophet, one of the biggest books in your Bible is Jeremiah. Listen to his words, this prophet of the Lord. In Jeremiah 20, verse 7, he says, O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I've become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me, for each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. Did you catch that? Jeremiah, the, the weeping prophet, he's saying, dear God, you, you tricked me. You tricked me. You called me to be a prophet even before I was born. Now I am a prophet and it stinks. I hate this. Uh, I'm getting weary of sharing your words. People are just laughing at me all day long. And Jeremiah even gets to the point where he says this later in that chapter, verse 14 Cursed be the day when I was born. Let the day not be blessed when my mother bore me. So what does God do in response? Well, he does not smite Jeremiah with leprosy. He doesn't squash him like a bug. No, rather he inclines his ear to Jeremiah's prayer. And then uh, exhibit B, if you will, Habakkuk, another prophet, another big complainer. <laughs> Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 and 4, just listen to this. This is Habakkuk talking to God, addressing God. He says, how long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted. Essentially, he's saying, I'm praying to you all the time, and nothing's changing. Nothing's happening. Everything around me is wrong. The world's in a horrible place. Why don't you do something about this, God? I'm calling to you for help, and you're not going to hear? So how does God respond to this complainer? Well, his response is not to open up the earth and, and swallow Habakkuk up. No, rather, he listens to his servant and he graciously responds to him. And then he puts his response in the Bible for us all to read. This is a, a patient God that we have. And, and this kind of patient response, just as a parent, I know is convicting. <laughs> uh, because sometimes... When you have children that are complaining, the last thing you want to do is be patient and incline your ear to them, you know? You, you just want to make them stop crying, or I'll give you something to cry about. You ever use that line? <laughs> Our tendency is to rebuke and shame, uh, but God is much more patient than we are. 
we complain a lot. We complain about life, about pain, circumstances, situations, detours, and God inclines his ear. And, and I don't want you to get me wrong. I'm not saying that God likes it. I'm just saying that he cares about us and that he listens to us. He's not an unhearing, unfeeling God. So now just listen as the psalmist describes in detail this physical and emotional toll of his suffering. Verse 3, he says, For my days have been consumed in smoke, and my bones have been scorched like a hearth. My heart has been smitten like grass and has withered away. Indeed, I forget to eat my bread. Because of the loudness of my groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. So we're seeing here that his grief is affecting more than just his mental health, but actually his physical health as well. He, he's pining away. He's saying he's so preoccupied he even forgets to eat. One commentator put it this way. He said, as the smitten flower no longer drinks in the dew or draws up nutriment from the soil, so a heart parched with intense grief often refuses consolation for itself and nourishment for the bodily frame and descends at a doubly rapid rate into weakness, despondency, and dismay. Once more, have you ever been there before? Have you ever been so troubled, so upset by something going on in your life that you neglect the care of your own body? Now the, the psalmist goes on, verse 6 and 7. He says, I resemble a pelican of the wilderness. I've become like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I've become like a lonely bird on a housetop. And I thought these, these images were, were very provocative. He, he's using images from the natural world, birds that he's looking around and seeing. And, and birds are interesting because they're normally social creatures. And yet here he's talking about birds that are isolated. You know, there's, there's nothing quite as lonely as a solitary bird. Uh, I went with my family up to Joshua Tree a few days back, and there's these little gambles quail. They're, they're super cute. They're going around the desert floor, and they have this, this call that's, like, pathetic. You know, you, you see them. It's funny because they lift up their head, and they have that, that thing on their head that kind of jiggles with the wind. And, and they're making this call, but it's, it's just so lonely. You know, they're, like, reaching out. Anybody? Are you there? And uh, birds are, are, are normally social, so it, it's, it's lonely when we see them by themselves. Think about birds. We see them lined up on telephone wires. We see them flying in V formation. And yet, he's describing the solitary bird here. And the psalmist is saying that's what he feels like. Now, the, the birds that the psalmist mentions here, the first one is hard to translate. And your translation in your lap might say something different than pelican. Uh, these are kind of like the main ones, the pelican, the cormorant, and the desert owl, and we actually have all of these here locally, but they're all quite different, so I'm like, okay, <laughs> I guess nobody really knows. Maybe it's a bird that's now extinct. Whatever it is, we see that same bird listed in Leviticus 11 as one of the unclean animals, and then the second bird is most certainly an, an owl when he talks about, I have become like an owl of the waste places. And once again, that was also an unclean animal, ceremonially, and it's a nocturnal bird. So all of this is just a metaphor. The picture we're getting is extreme desolation, isolation, and sleeplessness. And what an appropriate metaphor for what, to me, sounds a lot like depression. Think about the symptoms that we're reading so far. Body aches, sadness and heaviness of heart, no appetite, groaning, can't sleep at night, feelings of loneliness and isolation. He's depressed. This is depression. We're reading about it in our Bible. In summary, his strength was gone. He was, he was inwardly depressed, and he had even lost his will to live. And as if that wasn't enough, he, he goes on, verse 8. He says, my enemies have reproached me all day long. Those who deride me have used my name as a curse, for I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of your indignation and your wrath, for you have lifted me up and cast me away. My days are like a lengthened shadow, and I wither away like grass. Have you ever felt like you were in the crosshairs of an enemy? 
Have you ever had somebody target you or insult you, threaten you, even curse your name? It's not a good feeling. So here's the psalmist. You would just add the spite and malice of his enemies to his list of woes. Lack of appetite, fatigue, groaning, loneliness. And you're like, wow, he is going through it. These are all graphic ways of describing his grief here. Uh, When he talks about, I have eaten ashes like bread. Ashes were a symbol of mourning in ancient Israel. They would actually put them on the top of their head. He's saying that he wears them so frequently that they've fallen down into his daily plate of food and he consumes them. It's a, a meal of affliction. And then to his cup, he says, And mingled my drink with weeping. His tears have dropped into the cup from which he drank. And I know some of you are thinking about that Hank Williams song, There's a Tear in My Beer, right now. (laughs) But uh, that's really the idea. All of this grief. And what does it cause? It causes anxiety and depression. God, I understand that you're sovereign. I understand you're allowing all of this. But I don't know how much more I can take. I'm at the end of myself. I'm like a blade of grass that's withering. I, I, I feel like a disappearing shadow. He says, that language reminds me of the New Testament book, James, chapter 4, verse 14, in which James says, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And the psalmist here feels like the end is near. And there's times when depression of spirit can cause you to shrivel and you contemplate the end in a negative way. For some, existence can almost feel like like a breathing death. Now, I know that a lot of us know what it's like to have seasons of depression, you know, whether it's clinically diagnosed or not. This is part of the human condition. And on that same note, a lot of us know what it it feels like to deal with anxiety, panic attacks. Maybe, Maybe you don't even know the root of it, but you just feel it coursing through your body, you experience these symptoms that the psalmist is talking about. Many of us have been sad to the point where tears freely flow. And we feel like weirdos because of it, because we've been taught that Christians will be happy all the time. This is an important point. What if somebody asks you that dreaded question, you know, how are you? And you feel like, okay, if I'm a good Christian, I better answer this a certain way. You know, I'm fine. I'm dandy, you know. I'm good. I'm too glad to be sad. I'm too blessed to be depressed. I'm too holy to be lowly. I'm too cheery to be dreary. (laughs) God is good all the time. All the time God is good. How are you doing, brother? You know? Because if you feel depressed, well, it's clear. You you just don't love God enough. Or, Or if you're feeling anxious... Or if you're feeling down, clearly you just don't have enough faith. And and what I want you to understand today is that Psalm 102 shows us that anxiety and depression are biblical maladies. Believe it or not, people have struggled with this stuff for a very, very long time. There's in fact an entire book in your Bible called Lamentations. And who put it in there? God did. And it's interesting that nobody ever seems to do a series through that book. (laughs) <laughs> maybe it's not you know not an effective growth strategy for a church maybe we should try that right we could do uh, all songs in minor keys pass out tissues on the way in it'd be great but our God knows that to be human beings means to lament we humans need to be taught many things right we need to be taught math language history parallel parking all that But never were any of us ever taught to cry. Have you ever thought about that? No one taught you to cry. We we didn't need to be taught. It automatically happened when we came into the world. It's the very first human act. We get pulled out of mom's belly and we're like, wow, it's freezing out here. (laughs) What are all these blinding lights, loud noises? Uh, When you think about crying in this term, it, it, it actually is what unites us as human beings. To cry is to be human. So it's kind of weird that we grow up and we're afraid of it. Right? Some even go so far as to think that it's not Christian to have grief, to, to cry, to be sorrowful. That if you're a Christian, you can't acknowledge pain or, or grief 
fear or hurt. You just have to suppress it and always say that you're okay. Well, did you know that it's okay to not be okay sometimes? <laughs> it's okay to not be okay. Because you're a human being. And have you ever considered that lament can actually be a sign of true faith? Listen to this quote. This is from a book called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, Discovering the Grace of Lament. The author's name is Mark Rogup. Listen to what he says. He said, Lament is the honest cry of a hurting heart wrestling with the paradox of pain and the promise of God's goodness. Belief in God's mercy, redemption, and sovereignty create lament. Without hope in God's deliverance and the conviction that he is all-powerful, there would be no reason to lament when pain invades our lives. Todd Billings, in his book Rejoicing in Lament, helps us understand this foundational point. It is precisely out of trust that God is sovereign that the psalmist repeatedly brings laments and petitions to the Lord. If the psalmist had already decided the verdict that God is indeed unfaithful, they would not continue to offer their complaint. Therefore, lament is rooted in what we believe. It's a prayer loaded with theology. Christians affirm that the world is broken, God is powerful and he will be faithful. Therefore, lament stands in the gap between pain and promise. Let me say that again. Lament stands in the gap between pain and promise. To cry is human, but to lament is Christian. So for those of you in here today who know what it's like to struggle with depression on the one hand, anxiety on the other, I want you to know you're not some kind of weirdo freak. You're a person created in the image and likeness of God. You're living in a broken world, and sometimes, oftentimes, it hurts. God will never laugh at you for sharing your hurt with him. This is part of his omniscience. You know, he knows everything that you're going through. So go to him with your struggles. The Psalms and these penitential Psalms like Psalm 102 are reflections of the tension that we live in as we wrestle with the paradox of pain and God's goodness coexisting. What we've read so far has been nothing but an honest complaint to the Lord. But now we get to verse 12, which, which is a significant shift. Notice this. And also notice the first half was all first-person pronouns. I, me, my. Now look at verse 12. This is key. It says, but you, O Lord, abide forever. And your name to all generations. Significant shift. But you, O Lord. You here is actually emphatic in the original Hebrew. Don't miss the significance of this sudden shift. It's stressing the contrast between the psalmist's current condition and the Lord's unchanging character and nature. And this is going to cause the writer's complaints to be followed by, by confident praise. This is our, one of our points today. When I am in anguish, I can either stare at my despair or I can gaze at God. When I'm in anguish, I can either stare at my despair or I can gaze at God. We, we always have that choice. We can either stare at the dark cloud or we can look at the light. The truth is, the more that we stare at our despair, the more hopeless we will become, oftentimes. We get obsessed about all the what ifs. What's going to happen tomorrow? What about this? What about that? But on the flip side, the more you look towards the Lord, the more hopeful you will become. This is one of the reasons why it's incredibly important for us to be consistent in fellowship. Making church a priority, making gathering with, with God's people to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, to encourage and serve one another, to pray for one another, to be in the word, to learn theology, doctrine, and affirm these truths about God. When your life feels like it's falling apart, the people of God, the word of God can be a life preserver for you. So this is a way that we can gaze at God in the midst of what we're going through. Uh, you guys remember that, that little kid's song, This Little Light of Mine? Yeah? There's a, there's a line in there, and it's in the second or third stanza, I don't know, of that, that little kid's song. It says, don't let Satan it out. The sound guys are like this. Don't let Satan it out. And in verse 11, 
it seems like the psalmist's light has gone out. Uh, all of his pain has stolen his zeal for life. And, and maybe that's where you feel like you are today, on the verge of, of being extinguished. But in, in verse 12, there's a spark. There's a spark here. The psalmist shifts his gaze off of all the bummers, and he puts his eyes on the Lord. And it makes all of the difference. Thou livest, Lord, let me live also. There's a line of one famous theologian. Verse 13 through 17, let's look at these together. It says, you will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to be gracious to her, for the appointed time has come. Surely your servants find pleasure in her stones and feel pity for her dust. So the nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord has built up Zion. He has appeared in his glory. He has regarded the prayer of the destitute and has not despised their prayer. We're seeing that the psalmist, he's now, he's gaining a different perspective. He looks to the Lord. He's reminded of how good and faithful he is. And he's thinking in particular about God's faithfulness in Zion. Zion, the heart of Israel and Jerusalem, that's the site of the temple. God's dwelling place among his people, destroyed and rebuilt. Once again, we're not sure about the exact author or even the time of this writing, but perhaps this psalm is, is telling of the time of the Babylonian exile and the return to Zion. And then perhaps also it extends further into foretelling the time of Jesus' millennial reign on earth. But as the psalmist is reflecting on all this, God begins to lift his soul out of this emotional quicksand that he's in. And he's causing this anxious sufferer to reaffirm just how good God really has been. It's like, don't, don't forget all that I have done and all that I will do. The Puritan Stephen Charnock said this. He said, without faith, we are not fit to desire mercy. Without humility, we are not fit to receive it. Without affection, we're not fit to value it. And I think it's worthy to note at this point that nothing about the psalmist's circumstances have changed at all. You know, it's not like he's suddenly won the Powerball lottery or anything. You know, no, nothing's changed yet. It, it doesn't describe that his enemies got struck with leprosy. You know, whatever the bummer was, we, we can kind of know that it's still there. But the one thing that did change is who the writer is focusing on now. He's now fixated on the Lord, and now he can express faith with humility and with affection. And, and what exactly about God does he find so comforting? Let's read the rest of the verses in this psalm. Verse 18. This will be written for the generations to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord gazed upon the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to set free those who were doomed to death, that men may tell of the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. He has weakened my strength in the way. He has shortened my days. I say, oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old, you founded the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. The children of your servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. The psalmist, at first overwhelmed, but now he is ultimately finding comfort in the fact that the Lord abides that God is not he's not in trouble the psalmist might be in trouble but God is never in trouble God knows what he's doing uh, some people say that the only sure thing is that there's no sure thing have you heard that phrase before the only sure thing is that there's no sure thing well according to Psalm 102 that's a lie the only sure thing is our God the only sure thing is our God and this is our Second and final point today, my circumstances may change, but my God never does. This is a, a key to understanding the psalm. What has taken this afflicted man, this, this needy complainer, to a different place? It's his reflection on God's nature and character. 
Our circumstances change all the time, right? They can go from good to bad to worse, uh, but God does not change. And, And this is where the psalmist lands, you know. God, you're on your throne. You're always the same, no matter what. And this is actually the consistent message of the scriptures about God. This is the doctrine of God's immutability. That is, he does not change. Malachi Chapter 3, verse 6 says, For I, the Lord, do not change. And this is actually true of every member of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Chapter 1 of Hebrews actually directly quotes and applies Psalm 102. It applies it to Jesus Christ, to God the Son. That he, as God, is the eternal one, the creator and sustainer of the world. He's higher than any angel or man or created thing. And it's really a strong affirmation of the deity of Christ that Jesus is our God who never changes, who always has been and always will be there. And then later on in Hebrews, in chapter 13, verse 8, we read this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, why is this all so comforting? Because no matter how difficult our circumstances may become, our God can be trusted. This too shall pass. This is but a moment in time. Right? We, we go through many, many afflictions in life. I, I think somewhere else in the scriptures it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. What does it look like for you? I don't know all of it, but I know quite a bit of it. Issues in your marriage. Issues with your health. Financial issues. Issues with your children. Issues with the government. You know? <laughs> There's lots of afflictions that we go through. But what's common about all of them for the believer is that they're temporary. Whereas God is permanent. And so great relief comes from focusing on a sovereign, unchanging God and his eternal purposes. God's changeless character is a great comfort to us. It helps us view things in the context of eternity. Let me read this verse to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 16 through 18, Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, one other thing I want to talk about before we conclude is you might be saying, okay, well, why does God allow all this? Why does he allow? Well, have you ever considered what lessons that we learn when we go through affliction? Many lessons, but one of them is that I'm not in control. You kind of lose that illusion, right, that you are the one who's in control of your life. When the bottom drops out, you are quickly humbled, And what does that cause us to do? It causes us to look to God and acknowledge our need for him. We we always need him. We always do. We're dependent upon him. I mean, God is protecting us day in and day out. Imagine diseases, accidents. We don't even know all of the things that he's protecting us from. But this illusion that we're in control, sometimes God will allow the bottom to drop out so that we can acknowledge him for who he is. He is in control. You know at the grocery store, there's this little, uh, outside you can put a quarter in, it's like a little car or horse. The kids can ride on it, it just goes like this. And the kid gets on the back of that, that horse or, or in the seat of that car, and they think they're in control, right? They think they're in control. They're not in control, right? But things are just moving around. <laughs> I mean, that's a good analogy for life. We think we're in control. We think we're behind the wheel. But it's really God who who is directing our steps, teaching us, instructing us. And and these afflictions are not punitive. They're disciplinary to make us grow in Christ, grow in maturity, become more like our Savior. And talking about our Savior, I'd like to end our message here with this. Today, if you've been feeling down, sad, depressed, or anxious First of all, I want you to know that it won't last forever. 
But also I want you to know, to remind you, that God knows exactly what you're going through. The Bible tells us explicitly that Jesus was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Not that he was merely aware of grief, but that he actually was intimately familiar with it himself. Jesus was a poor man during his ministry. He had had nowhere to lay his head. Jesus felt physical exhaustion. Think about it. He was walking everywhere. He rarely turned anyone away. Maybe this is why he was sleeping in the boat in the middle of the storm. He was worn out. Jesus, like the psalmist, he had enemies. They were constantly plotting his demise. Jesus was betrayed. He was stabbed in the back by a close friend for 30 pieces of silver. You know, and actually, right as we were reading this, the Lord put it on my, on my mind when it, when it talks about, when the psalmist says, those who deride me have used my name as a curse. A light bulb went off when I was reading that earlier. People use Jesus' name as a curse all the time. He knows what that feels like, the sting of blasphemy. Jesus was wrongfully accused. They called him the devil for crying out loud. Jesus wept. Have you ever thought about that? God knows what it's like to feel tears on his cheek. Jesus suffered. He said in the garden, my my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. And Jesus felt forsaken as well. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said that when he took our sins upon himself, he knew the full weight of the righteous wrath of God against evil. And he did it all for you and for me. Sometimes we grieve. Sometimes we're brokenhearted. But Jesus knows what we've gone through. And the amazing truth of the gospel is that our God will never leave us nor forsake us. And he mends and binds up our broken hearts. Jesus died, but he rose again. He died to save us from our sins, but he rose to give us a living hope. As the psalmist elsewhere says, Psalm 30, verse 5, Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. So today, if you're going through it, if you feel like that, that lone bird, if you can't sleep, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, Hang in there and know that that God is in control. This is just a season. And ultimately, God is up to something. He's he's trying to teach you something. And one day, we're all going to be in heaven celebrating. And there's going to be no pain, no affliction there. Today, in Psalm 102, we pass through the cloud. Next Sunday, we're going to study the very next psalm, Psalm 103. And we're going to bask in the, the sunshine in that psalm. So uh, come back next week as we praise the Lord for his mercies. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the honesty of the scriptures. We thank you for Psalm 102, written by a man that we, we know not, but we know what it feels like sometimes to, to be depressed, to be anxious, and we know that our Savior went through all of these things when he took on flesh, the temptations, the accusations, the physical anguish, the the mental anguish that he endured all for us. Father, we thank you for your great love. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. If there's anybody today who needs to bow the knee to Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, would they do so? Acknowledging that, that they've sinned, but that you sent the Savior and your Son. They can acknowledge him right now, right from where they sit, and say to you in their heart, God, I believe Jesus is Lord. Thank you for his work for me on the cross and for his resurrection. I trust in him. I trust in you, God. Lord, we're we're grateful that you never change, and we go out and worship in song today, praising you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.